Tonight, investigators are following a number of leads in the murder of the Kaufman County, Texas District Attorney, Mike McClellan, and his wife. One of those leads is the possible involvement of a white supremacist group, and Bob Orr has more about that. Charles Lee Roberts is known as Jive. Larry Max Bryan goes by Slick. Federal prosecutors say they are two of the generals who govern the ruling council of the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas a violent white supremacist gang largely based behind bars. ABT, a whites-only gang, was founded in the early 1980s. Its 4,000 members show their allegiance with swastikas and other tattoos, some inside their lower lips. Many members are current or former convicts. Slick Bryan, for example, has been in prison for nearly 22 years. In a sweeping federal indictment last November, Bryan, Roberts and 32 other alleged gang members were charged with racketeering and crimes ranging from drug dealing to murder. Lanny Brewer was the assistant attorney general who led the crackdown. Today's indictment represents, ladies and gentlemen, a devastating blow to the leadership of ABT. But this new report from the Texas Department of Public Safety says the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas remains a dangerous threat with a large membership presenting a consistent level of violence and other criminal activity. ABT makes money selling methamphetamine both inside and outside of prisons. But prosecutors say another mission is violence, used to protect fellow members or to avenge perceived mistreatments. Assignments come from the generals and are passed down to enforcers. Prosecutors say one order, SOS, means smash on sight. That's code for assaulting a rival gang member. Then there's a green light sometimes simply called an X. That's a hit, an assignment to murder a rival or an ABT member who has violated the gang's rules. Over 30 years, the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas has been linked to some 10 kidnappings and more than 100 murders, many of those, Scott, behind bars and away from public scrutiny. Bob, thank you. And to updates on two shootings in Texas and in Colorado. Guards with semi-automatic weapons patrol Texas courthouses today after Kaufman County District Attorney Mike McClelland and his wife Cynthia were murdered Saturday night in their own home. It is the second shooting of a prosecutor in the small Texas town this year, coming just two months after Assistant District Attorney Mark Hasse was shot dead outside the local courthouse on his way to work. I'm joined now by Bill Zebel. He's covering the story for KER a public radio in North Texas. And Bill, welcome to the program. Tell us what you can about the investigation. What, what trail of events, what possible links are authorities looking at in trying to get to the bottom of who killed McClellan and his wife? Well, good to be here. Authorities are looking at gangs like the Aryan Brotherhood, possibly other gangs, because there seems to be a tie-in to these deaths. Uh, Mark Hasse, as you said, January 31st, and then almost two months later, uh, D.A. McClelland and his wife at home. So they're looking at, at anybody who would have a, a, a reason to kill these law enforcement officials. Vengeance might be one, and you will find uh, vengeful prisoners who might want to get these guys. They're, and within the Aryan Brotherhood, there was a message, uh, an email sent out from the U.S. Marshals that said, after an indictment last fall, um, against uh, members of the Aryan Brotherhood uh, that in December there was a warning that said uh, they might be out to attack and punish law enforcement officials and from Aryan Brotherhood anyway punishment could mean violence and death so that's a possible link it's not proven yet and, and so had uh, Assistant DA Mark Hasse or District Attorney McClellan been involved in any way in, in the furtherance of these indictments from last fall? Well, the office of the District Attorney in Kaufman County was one of a broad range of affiliates involved with the racketeering indictment, but just one of many. Uh, 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 Mr. Hasse wasn't directly involved in prosecutions uh, regarding members of the Aryan Brotherhood. That was according to Mike McClelland when he gave a press conference January 31st. And then there was no direct link uh, from the sheriff who talked to reporters the other day tying Mr. McClelland to the Aryan Brotherhood direct link. But Mike McClelland had said that uh, members mm -hmm. 
lived in and, and, and were involved in his community in Kaufman County. Now, so he knows they existed. Now, what, um, what is exactly the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas? I mean, what sorts of things are they accused of? Well, they're largely prison-based. They date back to California in the 1960s, so they've been around almost 50 years. Uh, it's a white supremacist group with, uh, with a military-style setup with uh, generals and, and other leaders. Uh, you're supposed to report to them, and you're not supposed to break any bond of loyalty at the risk of severe punishment or death. And they apparently make money from uh, illegal drugs and robbery and th thievery and all sorts of criminal activity. And I, I understand that also uh, investigators are looking at the killing of, speaking of prisons, a prison chief in Colorado just two weeks ago. Well, what could be the link there? Well, the link is the method. Uh, M Tom Clements, who was the chief of the prison system in Colorado was shot at, at his front door. Uh, knock on the door, opened it, and he was shot by a former prison inmate uh, from the Colorado prison. Then the other day, you know, the Clements family, uh, uh, rather the McClellan family, uh, were shot in home. Knock on the door, and then Cynthia McClellan was shot, and then a little further in the house, officials report uh, that they shot Mike McClelland. So knock on the door and the shootings then occur. And so that's, that's the common link. But uh, the officials, law enforcement officials have not been able to connect the dots directly to say beyond the superficial method that there's a link. Well, Bill Zebel of KERA in Dallas, thank you. You're welcome. We update the story of Texas officials shot to death recently as law enforcement investigates possible ties between the murders and a white supremacy group. Mourners fill the First Baptist Church of Sunnyvale outside Dallas, Texas this afternoon to remember Kaufman County District Attorney Mike McClelland and his wife Cynthia. The couple was found shot to death inside their home over the weekend. Their murders came two months after the county's assistant district attorney, Mark Hasse, was shot and killed. Before today's memorial service, Texas Governor Rick Perry announced he had doubled the reward to $200,000 for information leading to arrests in both cases. We cannot uh, react with fear. Uh, we've got to react with resolve. And uh, our local, state, federal authorities are pursuing every lead, uh, exhausting every line of inquiry uh, in a relentless pursuit of those who are responsible for these crimes. No suspects have been identified, but some attention has turned to a state prison gang, the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas. On Tuesday, the assistant U.S. attorney in Houston, who was to head the prosecution in a 2012 case involving 34 members of the white supremacist group, stepped aside from that role. He cited security concerns, according to an attorney for one of the defendants. I understand why someone would want to step back, and it makes, it makes sense to me, um, especially people that have families. The indictment tied to federal racketeering charges was announced last November. State officials later issued a warning that the group was, quote, involved in issuing orders to inflict mass casualties or death to law enforcement tied to the case. McClellan was part of a multi-agency task force involved in the investigation. And in Colorado, police continue the search for those tied to the murder of the state's prisons chief, Tom Clements, who was gunned down last month. Ex-convict Evan Ebel was one of the suspects. He was killed two days after Clements' death during a shootout with police in Texas. Colorado authorities are now looking for two other men, both associated with the white supremacist prison gang, the 211 Crew. For the latest on what is unfolding in Texas, we turn to Tanya Iser. She's a reporter with the Dallas Morning News. Tanya Iser, welcome to the program. Tell us what the latest is on these cases. Well, as you can imagine, there's still uh, authorities are still working around the clock on this investigation. 
Uh, they have not identified a suspect. In fact, they have no solid leads about any particular individual or individuals, uh, which is, of course, of great concern uh, given the nature of these assassinations. When you say no solid leads, literally no evidence at all? Well, I mean, I know people involved in this investigation, and they're running down hundreds of leads. Uh, there are many leads coming in regarding the Aryan Brotherhood. There are many leads coming in regarding possible cartel involvement, as well as other people that were prosecuted by that office. But they don't have any evidence that says, you know, this is the person or this is the, you know, the people that might have done this. So uh, it's, I, and from what I'm gathering from talking to people just last night, they, one official said to me, you know, it's a who done it. So, so the only connection then at this point to the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas, this, this prison uh, gang, is this threat that came out a few months ago. Well, it's a little more than that. Uh, I mean, yes, there was the, the, the threat that came out in December. Uh, there, have been, there has been some you know, leads that investigators have been following uh, about the Kaufman County office. They had prosecuted a fairly major case last year involving a high-ranking Aryan Brotherhood member. Um, and so there, there have been some uh, tips that perhaps it's linked to that, uh, that, invest that case. But to say that they've developed solid ev evidence of it, I can't say that. Tell us a little bit more, Tanya Iser, about the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas. Well, they're, they are obviously a very violent group. They were formed in uh, Texas prisons in the 80s. Uh, they modeled themselves after a California group. Uh, they are primarily involved in uh, meth dealing, um, and they are known for being ex particularly brutal uh, in the way they do their business. And active, obviously, inside the prisons, but what's the evidence or what's, what's their record outside prisons? Well, in, with, in the indictments that were handed down in Houston, uh, those involved a number of murders outside of prison, and in fact, uh, very vicious murders. And they also, in, within those indictments, there were a number of threats that involved law enforcement and threats to kill law enforcement. And in that, in the Kaufman County case, uh, th those involved uh, pretty brutal kidnapping, where uh, one of this captain uh, wanted to kill this guy because he wanted out of the group. Tell us, do you know any more about this Houston assistant U.S. attorney that's recused himself or said he's not going to be part of this anymore? Yeah, he basically sent an email to all of the attorneys that were involved in that, investi in, in, in that in case uh, Tuesday morning telling them that he had decided to uh, remove himself from the case and he cited security concerns. I spoke to a number of the attorneys in that case and they said that he didn't he wasn't specific about what those concerns were. So it's not known whether there's any connection to the Aryan Brotherhood of Texas or any other particular group? Well, I mean, he's obviously involved in the prosecution of the Aryan Brotherhood, so obviously he must have some concern. Now the question is, right. you know, did he receive a specific threat? We don't know. Uh, but, you know, what some law enforcement officials have told me is they're really concerned that when you start having prosecutors drop off cases, that sends a really bad message to, to the criminals out there. Is there any sense that there may be more uh, law enforcement officials who take themselves out of this investigation, out of this process? We haven't heard any reports of that. I, I have had a number of people who, you know, who simply don't want their names in the paper. You know, people in the past that would have been fine with having their names used. There's a lot of concern. Um, you know, people don't know, you know, the, you know, obviously you had the McClellans killed and Mark Hassey killed, but we don't know, are there other targets out there? And you mentioned a cartel. I assume you meant Mexican uh, right. drug cartel or criminal cartel earlier. Tell us what's known about any involvement they may have in this. Well, there have been some tips related to the Mexican cartels and perhaps that some of the cases that Kaufman County had prosecuted might have some, you know, might have some cartel involvement. Uh, you know, Kaufman County was known to be a district attorney's office that was very uh, tough. I mean, they, they didn't, you know, cut sweet deals. They, they pretty much went to the mat. So, you know, there were a lot of angry uh, criminals out there uh, who, who could have had reason to want to harm someone in the DA's office. And finally, tell us a little bit about the additional security that uh, is being provided law enforcement uh, officials uh, in the wake of all this in Texas. 
Yeah, they have around the clock security on many uh, on the members of the DA's office, not, and not just them. The judges in Kaufman County, the other elected officials uh, out there, you know, and you have to question and you have to wonder how long can it continue because um, obviously around the clock security is very expensive. Um, and But, uh, you know, what I'm hearing from the people involved in this investigation is that, you know, it's going to have to continue for some period of time because we don't know who is doing this and why and are there other targets. Tanya Iser with the Dallas Morning News. We thank you. Thank you. Benny Ann Bowser has the prison story. When these two white men were arrested in June and charged with the murder of a black man in Jasper, Texas, people were stunned. Police say the suspects, along with another man, chained James Byrd Jr. to the back of a pickup truck and dragged him down this country road to his death. And police say they did it because he was black. Walter Diggles is a lifelong resident and community leader in Jasper. Well, you know, you, you have that feeling of outrage and you just can't believe that there are people living this close to you would commit uh, that kind of a horrendous crime. I mean, it was just total shock. Police say suspects John William King and Lawrence Russell Brewer first met at this Texas prison. And while they don't know exactly when the two joined a splinter white supremacist group affiliated with the Ku Klux Klan, officials say they do know the suspects left prison covered with racist tattoos, a clear sign of gang membership. A possible connection between their prison experiences and the Jasper crime has brought attention to what's become a nationwide problem in prisons white supremacist gangs. Prison officials say part of the reason is the tensions created by more crowded prisons. And in Texas, a court-ordered integration plan has placed increasing numbers of Hispanic and black inmates in the same cells with whites. Warden Kevin Moore says white prisoners who are a slight minority in the prisoner population feel more isolated, more fearful of violence, and most important, more vulnerable to the lure of gangs. I think what causes people to, to uh, join these disruptive groups when they initially come into the system primarily is fear. You know, they, they don't know what to expect. Uh, they've never been locked up before. Uh, these gangs go to them and they tell them what they can do for them, that they can protect them and they can provide for them. And if you take a person that's not strong-willed and, and doesn't seem to be an individual, uh, they're susceptible to falling into these groups. These are some of the house rules. Robert Grant, a gang intelligence officer, says prison gangs are highly organized with sophisticated rules and regulations. This is a gang charter seized by authorities. The gangs not only provide protection, they become a way of life driven by strong ideological convictions. Troy Rogers is a leader of the Aryan Brotherhood at Cofield Prison in East Texas. The white race is so outnumbered in here. Any, 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 any day room that you walk into in this system, if you're white, you're going to catch hell. They're going to, black inmates are going to try you, they're going to try to hog you, they're going to try to take your money, they're going to try to make you ride, they're going to try to make you do homosexual acts because you're white, not because you're weak, not because you got money, because you're white. What does the Aryan Brotherhood believe in that appeals to you? that the white race comes first. That if we don't do something about our race now, it's going to come in, it's going to become instinct. Donnie Ruthhart is also a member of the Aryan Brotherhood. This place here breeds racial hatred. This place, this prison system teaches racial hatred. It breeds it and it stuffs it in you. You know what I'm saying? What is it about prison that can turn someone into a killer? Survival. I, I, as far I, you know, as far as me as a white man, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it straight to you like this: most of your 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 racial killings involving a white man killing somebody in this system is pure survival. Prison officials say black and Hispanic inmates are just as fearful of the whites, and that's why they form their own gangs. 
Warden Moore disagrees that it's the system that's responsible for turning some whites into killers. I don't think that the facility that they're in breeds this type of behavior. Uh, I think it's within them from the start. And, you know, once they, they do join a disruptive group, in this case, you know, a white supremacist group, I think that it probably does enhance the, the hatred a little bit more towards the particular races. But I think there had to be something there initially or, or you know, that they wouldn't have participated in that type of behavior. Prison officials are able to control some of the activities of gangs by keeping their leaders isolated from the rest of the prison population. Acknowledged gang captains like Troy Rogers spend 23 hours a day in administrative segregation. Officials say since they've imposed administrative segregation on large numbers of gang leaders and violent inmates, homicides in the system have practically stopped. But others say there is a downside to this kind of isolation because it also helps feed racist ideology. Carrie Noble spent 18 months in a federal prison as a leader of a white supremacist group. They get to prison, they find a people that they can belong to that supposedly has some answers. And then of course they have the isolation. Coming out of prison, they still have the isolation because they're covered with the tattoos. How are they going to fit in society? It's very common in the hate movement. If it's a minority, and especially if it's a black, they tend to think of them not as people, not as humans, as dogs. They're just lower creations. And you get to the point in the hate movement where a black man is no different than a dog. That attitude toward blacks makes gang members particularly dangerous when they leave prison. According to Sam Buentejo, who monitors gang activity for the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, crimes all over the state can be traced to gang leaders calling the shots from inside the prisons. He says besides being involved in hate crimes, gangs are involved in multi-million dollar gun and drug rings. When they get released, they are bound to this organization to continue illegal activities. They are basically ongoing criminal organizations. Uh, they make no bones about rehabilitation. Uh, they know what they're involved in. They know what they're going to do, and they go do it. Buentejo says prison officials across the country are now identifying branches of the same gangs originally found in Texas prisons. And to try and track the problem, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice recently announced the creation of a national information clearinghouse on gang members in and out of prison. Finally tonight, the Jasper, Texas verdict and to Phil Ponce. This afternoon, a jury in Jasper, Texas found 24-year-old John William King guilty in the dragging death of an African-American man, James Byrd, Jr. The crime last June put Jasper in the national spotlight. Here now with more is Clara Tuma, a reporter for Cork TV who's been covering the trial. Clara, it didn't take the jury very long to reach the verdict, did it? A little more than two hours, which was no big surprise. The lawyers even had hung around the courtroom because they thought this would be a fairly quick verdict. And Clara, take us inside the courtroom. Was there any visible reaction from the defendant when the, uh, when the verdict was read? There was not. In fact, he hasn't reacted during the entire trial, even when grisly testimony about autopsy reports and pathologists testified. He hasn't changed expressions at all. Again, he did not react when he went from accused murderer to convicted capital murder. No change of emotion. Clara, uh, and yet there was reaction in the courtroom itself. Tell us about that. There was. In fact, as the verdict was read, one lone spectator began to applaud, and then she quickly quit when nobody else fought, jumped in with her. As the jury was being taken out of the courtroom and led back to the jury room, there were still maybe eight or nine jurors in, and the audience erupted into applause and began to grow louder and louder until prosecutor Guy James Gray held up his hand and said, stop, the jury is still in the courtroom. Now, members of James Byrd's family had been there every day in numbers, more than a dozen family members every day in court. Several of them began to cry as the verdict was read, and perhaps the most noticeable reaction was from the father of the defendant. That's Ron King, the father. He's in a wheelchair, breathes from an oxygen bottle, is in very poor health, and he began to sob as his son uh, was convicted of capital murder. A priest who was sitting beside him leaned over and began to rub his back and whisper words of comfort to him. Clara, very briefly, uh, summarize what it is the prosecution said happened. 
happened out on the night of the murder. Yes, exactly. They, they say three white supremacists were out looking to get some attention to try and get a, uh, get publicity for a new racist group they hoped to start. They say they picked up James Byrd Jr., offered him a ride home with the, the black man, James Byrd, never suspecting what was about to happen to him. They say they took him to a dirt logging road, beat him up, and then chained him to the back of a pickup truck and drove him, dragged him on a road for almost three miles, ending in front of a black cemetery. And the evidence the prosecutors uh, maintain linked uh, Mr. King to the crime. What, what kinds of things did they say tied him to, uh, to, the, to the death? The direct evidence was some DNA evidence. They found blood from the victim on a shoe belonging to the defendant. They also found a cigarette butt out at the murder scene with the defendant's DNA on it out at the murder scene, along with a lighter that he used. They know it was his because it had the name Possum written on it with the S's in Possum as lightning bolts. And that is the defendant's nickname. That's how he signed many things. That's the direct evidence. Then they had other racist writings uh, indicating the defendant did not like African Americans and tattoos all over his body, I'm sorry, all over his arms, including one of a black man being lynched. And the prosecution argued, you look on his arms to see what's in his heart. But again, uh, earlier you alluded to the fact that uh, the prosecution maintains that the motivation was what? Uh, an attempt to, uh, an, an attempt to jumpstart a, a white racist group that right. the defendant uh, allegedly wanted to start? There was some writing found in his apartment that said he was starting a, a new group called the Texas Rebel Soldiers Division of the Confederate Knights of America. And the, the testimony from the state's experts were he needed a big event to try and garner publicity not only in the media but to find other white supremacists who wanted to come join in the group. And the state has speculated this murder might have been for that reason or there are three co-defendants in this case. One of them did not quote, earn his stripes in uh, in the white supremacy movement. And the state also says this might have been an initiation right for that third co-defendant, Sean Barry, to earn his way into a racist group. Uh, Clara, did uh, prosecutors say why it is they decided to try this defendant first of the three? They thought he was the ringleader. They thought he was the one who instigated the whole thing. It was his writing that was speaking of this new white supremacist organization. So they went with him first. And he chose not to testify in this trial, is that correct? He did, and that was strictly his decision. His attorneys say right up until the time they rested their case, they weren't sure. In fact, you saw it. We saw in the courtroom right before the defense rested, they leaned over and whispered something to him, and he shook his head. And then they stood up and said the defense rests. They said they weren't sure right up until that moment that he wouldn't take the stand and give jurors his version of events. So what kind of a case did the defense put on? Not not much of one in terms of real evidence. They only called three witnesses. It took less than an hour trying to explain some of the tattoos that have satanic ra uh, satanic symbols on them or racist emblems and tried to show that he got those behind prison bars when he was an inmate in the Texas prison system. The defense has maintained that prison made him do it, that he was fine until he went in. But when he was an inmate, he ran into... Uh, bigger inmates and badder inmates and meaner inmates and that he festooned his arms with these tattoos not because he necessarily shared those beliefs but as a way to try and intimidate other inmates and try to protect himself and they say that's why he joined uh, the Aryan Brotherhood in prison a racist organization was for his own protection and that was the thrust of the defense that's probably what we'll see in this the punishment phase as well and uh, tell us about the punishment puni punishment phase that's what the uh, that's what the jury is in the middle of now what what does decisions do they have to make? Well, the, the only, the final decision is, shall he be sentenced to death or shall he be sentenced to life in prison, which in this case would mean 40 years minimum before he's eligible for parole. It's more complicated than that. They're actually asked three questions. Uh, did he intend for this victim to die? That goes for in case he wasn't actually driving the truck. Prosecution says they don't know who was driving the truck during the dragging death. But if you're involved and if you encourage and participate, then you can be held just as accountable as the one who actually drove the truck. There's that. They have to decide, is he a continuing danger to society? And then the most important question, after looking at all the evidence, is there any reason you would like to give this defendant life instead of death? Clara Tuma, thank you very much. Let's do it. I don't know. Okay, you're, and you're in tight? Okay, it's Art or Arthur do you prefer to go by? Arthur on Arthur Spitzer official okay. purposes. Um, in, in the Dawson case, the jury learned that uh, Dawson was a member of a group, a white supremacist group, the Aryan Brotherhood, a hate group. Uh, they were shown pictures of his tattoos, including the one across his stomach, Abaddon, referring to 
the, uh, the biblical uh, reference to the angel of the bottomless pit. Mm -hmm. uh, why shouldn't the jury, in assessing whether Dawson gets a death sentence, consider these things? Well, the problem with that kind of evidence is that it doesn't tell the jury anything about what he's done. It tells the jury about what he believes, um, religious sorts of beliefs, philosophical sorts of beliefs. Um, but there was no proof that, that these groups he was involved in had committed violent acts or criminal acts. Uh, there was no proof that his association with those groups was based on, on his desire to do violent or criminal acts. Um, and so it appeals to the prejudice of jurors who say, boy, anybody who uh, has a tattoo like that must be a bad guy, or anybody who'd hang out with people like that must be a bad guy. It's really a form of guilt by association. Um, and, and what it makes me think of is, what if there had been a, a criminal defendant in uh, Alabama or Mississippi in 1965 and the jury had been told that he was a member of the NAACP. Uh, that might have no relevance at all to the appropriate punishment, but you can imagine some jurors getting very upset about it. Or, or what if a, uh, a juror who was very pro-choice on the abortion issue was told that some defendant was, was active in Operation Rescue? Um, it's, it's really just not relevant information. What's relevant is what the person has actually done. Well, what about the argument that these are, are views and associations that uh, the vast majority of Americans find deeply offensive. Well, the vast majority of Americans may be quite right to find these views deeply offensive. But when we're sentencing someone for a crime, uh, the appropriate question is, what has he done? Um, and not, what does he believe? Uh, are his views offensive? Um, uh, if you're uh, an atheist, that doesn't mean you should get a death sentence or a longer jail sentence than if you're not an atheist. It depends what you've done. Um, it, uh, uh, sentencing phases, of course, differ from the, 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 the guilt or innocence phase, and everybody seems to agree this is inadmissible at the guilt or right. innocent phase. But at the sentencing phase, the defendant is entitled to uh, present all kinds of evidence showing that He's a good person, that mm -hmm. he belongs to the, uh, uh, the church choir or that he's right. a, 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 within the Rotary Club. Uh, if the jury is to have the accurate picture, why shouldn't they get both sides? Well, I think that's a, a problematic issue in sentencing. Really, uh, the fact that some defendant has uh, sung in the church choir shouldn't carry all that much weight either, I imagine. Um, I think what the idea is is that uh, the jury is supposed to get this information to make a prediction about the defendant's future dangerousness in a death penalty case. Um, I don't think singing on the church choir indicates much about that. And similarly, uh, having a, a tattoo on your stomach doesn't indicate much about that either. Um, uh, I, you know, the, the relevant information might include testimony by witnesses who've spoken to you, what kinds of things you say about your, your thoughts and plans, or a psychiatrist. Um, but, but this is really, uh, the best phrase, I think, is guilt by association. Because he hangs out with a bad bunch uh, doesn't mean that he, should be, uh, uh, that he should be considered to be the same as the worst of them. Um, I'm, I wouldn't want to be judged by the worst of my friends. Mm -hmm. You don't argue with the, the, the right of the defense to present evidence showing uh, associations with favored groups? Well, typically, I guess, we give the defendant more leeway than we give the state. Um, uh, because after all, his life is at stake, um, and, and we try to bend over backwards to, to be sure that the defendant isn't precluded from bringing in evidence in his favor. Um, and we hold the state usually to a stricter standard. For example, the state has, has always uh, has been prohibited from discriminating in picking the jurors based on race. Um, and up until now, at least, the Supreme Court, as you know, has a case on it this term. Uh, the defendant has been allowed to exercise those kinds of challenges, however he desires. Uh, that may not be the law a year from now. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but we do tend to give the defendant more leeway, and I think that's probably appropriate. So in this case, though, I mean, if, if this evidence is admissible, the concern seems to be that it is inevitable, you at least run the risk, but inevitable that the risk will, will become realized, that someone will get a death sentence on the basis mm -hmm. of their views or the company they keep. Well, that's right. And a lot of the effort in death sentence cases is to be equitable among different defendants. 
Um, and so you can imagine a case where you have a defendant who committed a similar crime under similar circumstances, um, convicted based on the evidence, and then one sentence to death and one sentence to life imprisonment because one hung out with a motorcycle gang and the other didn't, or one was an atheist and the other belonged to a church. Uh, I really don't think that kind of, of distinction uh, should mm -hmm. be allowed. But by uh, not allowing this evidence in, you also have more than a risk, but a virtual certainty that the sentencing jury is going to have a one-sided picture. Presented by the defendant. Well, certainly uh, if the defendant tries to present facts that are not true, the prosecution can rebut them. So in that sense, the defendant can't just make things up. Um, but there are many things that, that we don't allow the state to present in evidence at the trial or at the sentencing. Um, uh, and I think one of the things, some of the things that would not be relevant would be what is his religion, what books does he read, um, what political organization does he work for. I mean, what if they had evidence to show that he had been a, a volunteer in the David Duke campaign? Uh, is that something that the jury ought to be allowed to know? Um, especially if they were people, or some of them were people who might be prejudiced against someone with David Duke's beliefs. Uh, when you're talking, especially when you're talking about a matter of someone's life and death, I think you should be very careful about what kinds of information the jury gets to hear that might be used unfairly to put someone to death. 